So who are OpenAI? It's a Microsoft funded company and they have um, the product that everybody has been talking about, ChatGPT. So um, what that is, it's a large language model and it's generative AI. So I'm sure just about everybody who's on the webinar here has used it. You put in questions, you get it to give you, I heard one person, uh, it gave them a speech um, that last minute they got dropped into, um, they had to do the speech at a wedding and um, it chat GPT to the rescue. <laughs> so it's weird and wonderful, um, a lot of different uses. And really sort of the whole thing here is that it is generating responses and it's understanding and it's a very sort of broad understanding of a lot of different topics um that uh now look chat gpt is just one there's bard there's a whole list of other ones out there uh, again i think chat gpt um they're the sort of first market first mover advantage um they already have um sort of a billion people have used it um in the uh, the first um short number of months. So it's one of those that has gone from um, nowhere to be an overnight success very quickly indeed. Um, if you look at um, and you type in uh, ChatGPT, give me a hundred word history. That's what it tells you there. So I'm not gonna read that. So actually we're getting ChatGPT um, to give some of the answers, but really I think what the main thing for me would be, if I just pick out on the, the last piece there, it, showcases the potential um, of um, the language models um, and it's it's inspiring people their curiosity um, you probably have had conversations in work about gosh how could we use this could this be used in work and absolutely there are certain things that you know work could uh, could you know workplaces could uh, could use this but really the main thing though at the moment is that um, it's looking now for the business applications and that really would be where um, the, it, it, it's, it needs to take it next. So really, uh, you know, all fine and dandy, um, you know, as I say, again, I put into uh, ChatGPT, what are the top 10 questions that get asked? And as you would imagine there, that there's some quite mundane uh, and then some specific ones around sport and stuff like that. But again, it's just more curiosity, getting people talking and what have you. But, you know, business has um, invested a lot in this. And um, what will happen is more and more of these are going to come into um, the business realm. One area that is challenging at the moment is uh, hallucinations in the larger language models. And that really will be where um, if the um, AI doesn't have a precise answer, uh, it will fill in the blanks. So um, that's what it's called an hallucination. And sometimes they can be wildly um, inaccurate or quite close to the truth. But again, they're not based on reality. So roughly it's about 20% at this time. And that's where the challenge for business comes in, that um, you, know, you, you have to have that much higher level of certainty. So in a lot of instances, the generative AI probably isn't at a sufficient level at this moment in time to be used within a business environment. Um, but really what you will find, uh, and this is where and why there's so much, and there's billions been invested in this area um, to date, that um, those large language models are going to start to uh, position and move into very specific and focused business applications. As I said, these companies, they've, they're investing, have invested and are investing today um, billions. Uh, so what you're going to see happen over the next 12, 18, 24 months is a lot more of these AI models coming out but they'll be very focused in on business. So doing a specific job for a business. Um, and that really is what you're gonna see. Uh, because look, the, um, there's a lot of language, common language that's used in uh, different industries, but they mean something different every time. So that really is where that the large language model, it's going to evolve. It's going to be very business specific. So at the moment, say chat gpt it's very wide and it's deep enough so it'll answer a lot of topics but they're really sort of uh, and especially say the collections world is a really good example 
there has to be guardrails, there has to be compliance issues thought about. There's a lot of different things. So again, what you're going to see is to say, um, is the likes of what we have done at Webio over the past four years, it's a customized collections language model. And again, diving into the very specifics about a particular industry, uh, as I said, you're going to see more of that. And that's something that we have been working on for the past number of years. So, um, Joe, um, from your own point of view, you, you've seen a lot of this happen already. Um, give us your own uh, thoughts on that one. Yeah, look, Mark, great job for um, teeing up what's happening around the, the large language models. Um, it's a real buzz, you know, generative AI. Everybody wants to talk about AI, but I think the the, the first and most important thing is as we move into talking about our customized collections language models it is for the audience to understand that we're not uh, just riding that wave and ride, riding that buzz and excitement. This is uh, These are models that we've been investing in and working on for at least the last six years. So this whole buzz around uh, generative AI um, is useful in terms of there's a lot more awareness about AI, but what it means for us is that we need to be really specific amongst all the noise about how we differentiate and what our focus is. So obviously these are customized collections language models, models that are being developed specifically for collections conversations. So using real collections data with all of the sensitive information taken out, models that can provide fluid, engaging conversations across digital channels with consumers uh, around uh, their financial circumstances so a little bit more detail about you know what this is firstly these models are models that um, can absolutely be trusted so you mentioned there mark about hallucinations that that is a real um, valid issue uh, amongst um, all industries that are starting to, um, let's say, explore generative models. You know, I was reading some use cases um, that have been published recently from all different sectors, and um, whether it was, you know, m and or other industries, there was one common thread when reading all of those um, kind of published use cases about the early stages of adopting large language models, and that is that um, leaders are still making sure that users are in place within the business to verify any critical outputs and that they can override yeah. when necessary. So in other words, with a large language model, like we can't apply that straight to um, collections conversations because nobody's gonna um, put the, the trust in that large language model to provide a response um, that they feel assured is going to um, be correct. Um, you're opening yourself up to a whole world of issues, not knowing what is being said back and forth. That doesn't happen here. Like we know, we work with the customers on the messaging. What we're doing is providing models to drive uh, those messages at the right time in the right place. We know what is going to be said. So we've got absolute trust there in terms of no issue with hallucinations. The other thing here is that when we talk about these um, sort of cognitive services and third party services from Google, from Amazon, from Microsoft, there's a real compliance issue there in terms of the data sharing, right? We don't have that issue. These are our models. There's no um, compliance concerns over you know, signing up to those third parties, as well as the painful process of, okay, we've got to onboard Webio, but then onboard these third parties as well. We don't have any of that. So all good from a trust perspective, all good from a compliance perspective, all good in terms of ease of process. I suppose the other thing that I chuck in there before we move on is around um, trust on accuracy. So just at a high level metric, a good one to note is that we don't roll out um, our models um, of a performance less than 85 or 86% as a starting point in terms of accuracy then when they're in play, we're working to fine tune up to 90 to 94% accuracy as a standard metric with Webio. So we've got trust in place. What we then have is um, under, understanding that these models are performative at scale. So this comes a lot in, uh, up a lot in the conversations that I have with the partners that we work with, with, with um, partners that we are in conversation with. And what this is all about is that it's one thing to demonstrate how an AI model performs um, at a low usage level, but how does it perform? How do the algorithms work when, let's say, 
um, a utilities company has a service outage and all of a sudden there's a spike of hundreds of thousands of messages coming in. We demonstrate that our models remain performative when scaling at scale and when scaling back and they will auto scale in that manner in line with usage. The other thing to note here which often isn't thought about is that we have created models that fit the language of today okay so we've built these models on a history of collections data they will understand the terminology of our industry what people often don't consider is what's going to happen over time so some organizations may try and develop their own model um, that may work to a certain scale and it may work for a certain period but what we need to do is protect ourselves from what we call model drift in other words, over time, new terminology is going to come in. Will your model be performative in line with the messages and the language that are coming in in a couple of years, even six months from now? And examples there would be, will it understand what wire is when talking about wire transfer? The big trend coming in around open banking, are the models going to understand language that fits in with terminology around open banking? With our expertise and our focus in purely fine tuning continuously these models for these conversations we protect ourselves in terms of performative at scale but also performative over time as well so look let, let's hone in in um you know the topic for uh today you know we're talking about how we can use these models specifically to help drive positive outcomes uh for vulnerable customers the, the first thing here is we're talking about digital channels we're, we're talking about conversational AI and having digital channels uh, in itself, I believe is, is the best starting point in terms of helping vulnerable customers. Now, there are circumstances where um, the consumer will need to um, talk to an agent and we make that possible, but also many circumstances where the starting point in a vulnerable situation is having the option after hours is, is having the option, the ease of access over a, a non-threatening digital channel to engage in the first place. What we want to do is make sure when the consumer is engaging around their vulnerability, that we provide a positive human-like experience across the AI and keep that conversation moving forward in a very fluid way 